Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at the History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and the History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join the History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with the History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at historyguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy tells several stories of little-known pieces of American military history. First, he tells several stories about the U.S. military and Christmas. And then, he'll talk about the most important part of a soldier's rations, the candy. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Christmas is traditionally a family holiday in the United States, but it wasn't always the case. In fact, in early U.S. history, Christmas was often rejected as being too British, or if it was celebrated, it was more of a rowdy celebration than a family celebration. Many historians credit the change in American Christmas traditions to five installments of The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon by author Washington Irving that were published in January of 1820. The sketchbook followed the fictional Jeffrey Crayon as he celebrated Christmas traditions in an English manor house, and those traditions were actually not based on any real celebration. They were largely fabricated by Washington Irving, but they conjured up that idea of a holiday spent with family, with goodwill towards all, that became the American Christmas tradition. And as we celebrate those traditions, we should be mindful of those who, for whatever reason, are unable to be near their family during the holiday season especially those whose service keeps him far from hearth and home. Christmas 1775 was busy for George Washington and the Continental Army. At 4 p.m. on Christmas Day, the Army turned out for their evening parade. They were issued ammunition and told that they were departing on a secret mission. At 6 p.m. they started crossing the Delaware River, a feat that the man in charge of the crossing, Chief of Artillery Henry Knox, described as having occurred with almost infinite difficulty, due largely to the presence of large chunks of ice floating in the water. Nonetheless, owing largely to the expertise of the men of the 14th Continental Regiment, known as the Marblehead Regiment, since it was composed of mostly seafaring men of the area around Marblehead, Massachusetts, the Army managed to cross without the loss of a single man. The following day, in a short, sharp action, Washington and tw some 2,400 troops managed to largely surprise and entrap 1,500 Hessian troops under the command of Colonel Johann Rall in the town of Trenton, New Jersey. 22 Hessians were killed, including Colonel Rall, and nearly a thousand captured, along with a significant amount of food and ammunition. The victory, although small in the scope of the war, came at a critical moment for Washington and the Army, perhaps literally rescuing the American Revolution from collapse. While it has been commonly said that the German troops were drunk from a Christmas celebration, contemporary reports deny that legend. You can't help but feel for these Hessian troops, captured and nearly freezing to death on the trip back across the river, so far from their homes, the day after Christmas. The Continental Army faced the same challenges as any army, away from home, far from family. And one illustration of that was a little-remembered event that occurred at Fort Ticonderoga in New York on Christmas Day, 1776. Fort Ticonderoga, at the south end of New York's Lake Champlain, had originally been built by the French in 1757 and 58 during the Seven Years' War. It was captured by the British in the 1759 Battle of Ticonderoga, in which the fortifications were largely destroyed, and then occupied by the British with a small force, which used the fort as a supply and communication point between Canada and New York. By 1775, the fort had fallen into disrepair and was defended by a token force of just 50 men. Just a month after the first shots of the American Revolution at the battles of Lexington and Concord, colonial militia under Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold surprised the tiny garrison of the fort, capturing it. Although it was only a small action, it was significant in that it disrupted communication between British in the colonies and British Canada, and resulted in the capture of a significant amount of artillery, which the American rebels had great need. Using Fort Ticonderoga as the jumping-off point, the Americans had attempted to invade Quebec in 1776, an invasion that ended in failure. But the fighting season had ended before the British could attempt an assault on the fort. 
Christmas, 1776, had American troops stationed at the fort and around Lake Champlain, preparing for the anticipated invasion of the area by the British in 1777. Regiments from around the colonies were stationed in the area. The colonies were a diverse lot, and there were quite a lot of cultural differences and animosities, in this case between New Englanders and troops from the South. Discipline can be a challenge for any army, especially in remote outposts, and perhaps more so in the Continental Army, which suffered from divided commands. Late on Christmas Day, 1776, in a fight not with the British, but between Americans, a regiment from Pennsylvania attacked a regiment from Massachusetts, dragging their officers from their tents, assaulting them, and robbing them. Details are sketchy, as the events of the disturbance were, if not covered up, at least kept quiet. The fight may have been the result of secular tensions, class tensions, and the enemies of troop morale everywhere, boredom, and too much drink. While no one appears to have been killed in the fracas, there were injuries and at least a few musket shots fired. A court-martial failed to find convictions, and the event was swept under the rug, with the official log at Ticonderoga that day left completely blank. Historians have only recently been able to piece together the event from period letters and records from the court-martial. It is easy to see why the army was not keen to publicize the event, as such interesting fighting could have ended the revolution before it started. If the Christmas of 1775 had brought Washington victory at Trenton, Christmas 1777 was perhaps the low point for Washington and his army, in their winter quarters at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. While the Americans had won a great victory over General John Burgoyne in the Saratoga campaign to the north, the British had captured the then American capital of Philadelphia, and Washington had been unable to recapture it. When his army went into winter camp, they were facing a critical shortage of supplies. The legend is that the winter of 1777 was exceptionally harsh, but that was not actually the case. The deprivations faced by the 12,000 men of the Continental Army in 1777 were caused by neglect, as local counties failed to provide for their own militias, and the Continental Congress seemed unwilling or unable to provide for adequate supply. Many soldiers were without shoes. The Marquis de Lafayette described them. The unfortunate soldiers were in want of everything. They had neither coats, hats, shirts, nor shoes. Their feet and legs froze till they had become almost black, and it was often necessary to amputate them. Washington had hoped for a brilliant winter action to rescue morale and support as he had done at Trenton in 1775, but was told by his officers that his army was, frankly, unfit for attack. He considered threatening resignation in order to force Congress to act, even as other officers conspired against his leadership within the Continental Congress. A blizzard hit on December 23rd and continued through Christmas. It was a dismal holiday. Troops were fed a Spartan meal of burnt mutton and watered grog. That night, a soldier from Connecticut's 7th Regiment, a freed black man whose name was only recorded as Jethro, was found frozen to death in his tent. It was the first recorded death on the rolls at Valley Forge. Some saw the time as an existential crisis for the army and the revolution, which seemed to be on the verge of collapse. Washington reportedly asked a young lieutenant that Christmas day, Have you not suffered enough? The officer responded, Having come this far, we can but go the rest of the distance. With you to lead us, we can't lose. Outside his command tent that night, Washington made a bleak holiday speech. May God relieve your sufferings, if the Congress will not. And a good Christmas to you. But it was that winter and the coming spring when the Continental Army was reorganized and seemed to coalesce in the face of adversity. From the bleak Christmas came what many see as the turning point in the conflict. By the time that America was again fighting the British in the War of 1812, Christmas had largely fallen out of vogue in America, where the practice was viewed with disdain as being both too British and too Catholic. On Christmas Day, 1806, a riot had occurred in New York City between nativists and Irish immigrants over the celebration of Christmas, one of many such disturbances in New York City of the era. British troops in North America noted with surprise the indifference to the holiday among Americans and French Canadians. But there was a great Christmas celebration that occurred as part of that war. It was on Christmas Eve, 1814, that negotiators in the neutral city of Ghent in the United Netherlands concluded their negotiations and signed and affixed their seals to the treaty ending the war. The treaty essentially returned to the status quo before the war, demonstrating perhaps the futility of the entire conflict. But the defeat of Napoleon in 1814 had ended the issues of restricting trade with France and the need for the British Navy to press sailors, which had been the sticking points of the war. Both sides simply wanted peace. That agreement came too late to inform either army before the January 8th Battle of New Orleans, and was not official until ratified by Congress the following February. But when the British and American representatives sat down to a Christmas dinner of beef and plum pudding, and drank toast to the health of King George and President Madison, 
they had a legitimate cause for celebration, as the treaty initiated what has become more than two centuries of peaceful relations between the United States and Britain. But American Christmas traditions were still developing, and that was well illustrated in the nearly forgotten 1826 eggnog riot. In 1826, in order to help quell what had become an unruly reputation, U.S. Military Academy Superintendent Colonel Sylvanus Thayer had prohibited the purchase, storage, or consumption of alcohol on campus, meaning that cadets could not enjoy what had previously been the Academy's holiday tradition, drinking highly spiked eggnog at Christmas. In violation of this rule, cadets snuck in two gallons of whiskey and a gallon of rum for a clandestine party to be held in the North Barracks. Drunken cadets then got out of control, doing property damage and harassing and assaulting Captain Ethan Allen Hancock, a faculty member who tried to restore order. In the end, nearly a third of the cadets at the academy were involved. Twenty cadets were court-martialed and eleven were expelled. Among those implicated but not charged was Cadet Jefferson Davis, who would later become president of the Confederacy during the U.S. Civil War. Reportedly, he was saved because, being among the first to get drunk, he had passed out before most of the rioting began. Had he been expelled, preventing his military career upon which his future was derived, history may have been different. Christmas was a dismal affair for American troops in the Ardennes Forest in 1944. Germany had mounted a significant counterattack on an area that Allied planners had thought too inhospitable to vehicles to be a point of attack. The area was lightly defended by mostly either inexperienced troops or those that were being given a rest. The front was thrown into chaos when some 200,000 Germans with a thousand tanks started one of the last major German offensives of the Second World War. Launching on December 16th, the apex of the battle was the siege of the important town of Bastogne, Belgium, which held crossroads critical to the German line of attack. A mixed force centered around the U.S. 101st Airborne Division was encircled and spent Christmas in the midst of one of the fiercest battles of the Western Front. While church services were held in the town, Christmas was a makeshift affair. One soldier, so disabled by bronchitis, pleurisy, and pneumonia, had to literally crawl into town as his unit could not spare men to carry him. He said that the closest he came to Christmas dinner was seeing the turkey leg the doctor was eating as he examined him. Other troops recalled being offered hospitality by Belgian civilians. But one story of that Christmas sticks out, as related by Fritz Winken, who was 12 years old the Christmas of 1944. He and his family lived on the German-Belgian border, and his father had sent he and his mother to a small hunting cabin in the Ardennes Forest, thinking it would keep them safe. His father had been called into the Civil Defense Corps, but he had hoped to come to the cabin to celebrate Christmas. When Fritz heard a knock at the door on Christmas Eve, he hoped it was his father. But instead, it was three American soldiers, one of whom was wounded. They did not speak German, but one of them spoke some French, and they were able to communicate enough with Fritz's mother, Elizabeth, to say that they had lost their unit, had been wandering the forest for days, and were out of food. Knowing that helping the enemy could be punishable by death, she let them inside. She had a chicken and some potatoes with which to make Christmas dinner. Shortly thereafter, there was another knock on the door. When Elizabeth answered, she found four German soldiers. Knowing the volatility of the situation, she told them they could come in only if they accepted her other guests. They were apprehensive when they saw the Americans, but she told them, This is a holy night, and there will be no shooting here. The soldiers all gave up their weapons, and that Christmas, Fritz, Elizabeth, and seven soldiers ate a meal of chicken soup and potatoes, and slept in the small cabin. One of the Germans spoke English, and had been a medical student. He gave the wounded American first aid, and in the morning gave the Americans directions back to their lines. It was a brief moment of peace in the midst of war. Fritz eventually immigrated to the United States, and in 1995 his story was featured on the television program Unsolved Mysteries. And astoundingly, that episode led him to Ralph Blank, one of the soldiers who had spent that Christmas with him. The two were reunited in 1996 over a bowl of chicken soup, where they could reminisce about that extraordinary night. Ralph passed away in 1999, and Fritz died in 2001. From everyone here at the History Guy, we wish all of our viewers, and especially those whose service keeps them away from home on this holiday, a very Merry Christmas. And now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the History Guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. We'd also like to welcome Betty Jo, the History Mom and my grandmother, back for another round of the History Guy podcast. So it's Christmas time in the United States and elsewhere in the world, and it we, is. I think we Merry agree Christmas. that... 
Christmas is one of the most important holidays. I think in America, it's kind of, I think it's probably king probably, yeah. of the holidays. There are other, ho there are lots of other holidays that people care about. But I think it's really interesting, you know, when you talk about this episode in military history, how you can trace the changes uh, to Christmas as a holiday in general. Mm -hmm. And we can see how it's changed, especially in the United States, from uh, a holiday that was not necessarily the family close holiday that we now know it as today. It is. I mean, it's interesting to look at. You see that, too, if you look at the history of Christmas trees and et cetera. Our traditions in America have changed very much over the years. And actually, the, the thing that we think of as a traditional Christmas is kind of a relatively new thing in America. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing because a lot of them came came around in the in the 1800s, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's amazing how quickly it becomes. You know, this is how we've always done it, even though maybe it's only what five six generations, something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's it's amazing, and I think what you know one of the one of the things that you talked about in here was the the eggnog riot, mm -hmm. and to, to some extent. <laughs> Uh, rioting drunk drunkenly on eggnog is actually more uh, traditional. <laughs> Christmas goes goes yes. further back. I mean, you know, they, that's that's a heck of a story there, and it, you know, it had, they were trying to change the tradition because the, the school had gotten that reputation yeah. for being unruly. Uh, and so, yeah, the eggnog riot uh, it says a lot of things about a lot of things. Very interesting that it involves Jefferson Davis, uh, but yeah. it really does say that we used to see Christmas really very differently. And you know, the idea that the Cadets would make spiked eggnog, and that's what they did on Christmas. That was, you know, that was very different than what we see today. Yeah, there's still there's still some drinking on Christmas, but I think we don't usually think of it as like a as a rowdy holiday anymore. No, no, it's, that's yeah. the. That's I think you know I don't know if if we've got any uh, special traditions for Christmas that you know we've we've uniquely done in our family. I think we usually do pretty pretty regular Christmas things. We do some stuff with my with my mom's family here in Wyoming. We, we have some, but I think they're mostly what people do. You have your Christmas morning opening gifts and Santa Claus and all that good stuff. Can you think of anything that you guys, that, that you did when you were younger in Christmas? No, that was I mean, like a Christmas say, I mean, tradition? We've always lived with the, it's a, it's a family thing. And in the morning you open Christmas presents and that was always a big deal to us. And uh, we were, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my dad was with the, the federal government. And so we lived a long way away from extended family. It was really kind of just us in town. Uh, so it depends. I mean, there, there are points where we've traveled and, and actually uh, mom for her second marriage was married at Christmas time. Uh, and so we had, we were talking about where yes, we were. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I would have been, uh, late husband would have been celebrating the 27th, my 27th anniversary as of today. As of today. Uh, yeah. We were, everybody was, uh, was at the Broadmoor in, uh, in Colorado Springs uh, for a big wedding at that time. Yeah. And so uh, this wow. is a, spe this is a special day. Uh, but also, uh, no, our family was very, very tra traditional and came back from, uh, my family, we we all, we traveled. We went to two family if we could, uh, but uh, but then after we moved after we moved the family to South Dakota, it was kind of just it was us, yeah. and it worked fine. But you know, we had a tree. Uh, we had cats that messed with our tree, uh, and we had presents under the tree, and and uh, we would open those on Christmas. I think we would get to open one on Christmas Eve. Uh, and then we'd open the rest of them on Christmas and, morning. And a large, large number of, of good friends that we spent. So we spent an awful lot of time with uh, uh, in the community. So I understand, you know, when I grew up, it was essentially a Christmas story. I mean, we grew up in rural South Dakota. Everybody had a BB gun. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there was there's always a bully of some sort down the street. And, and, mm -hmm. and the furnace was always acting up. So I think uh, I, I think we lived pretty much well, you know, almost the Norman Rockwell version of, of Christmas when, when I was a kid. Yeah. I think it's 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 a pretty close to universal experience these days, and it has been for for quite a while yeah. now. But it is always interesting to me because this is not the kind of Christmas that you know the Puritans banned. Christmas yeah, banned back Christmas. In. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, and much of it derived on a, a really a very much a fictional account of a traditional history yeah. or Christmas in 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 the UK. So it's kind of funny that it turned into what it is. And you know, it's it's lovely. It's lovely to have a time where you count blessings. It's lovely to have a time when you spend time with family. It's lovely to have a time when you share gifts that show what you love. Uh, and you know, America, of course, there's very much a religious tradition. And although yeah. uh, the, the Supreme Court has also determined that there's a secular meet reason for Christmas and so that it's not a violation of the First Amendment to, to have Christmas off at work. But uh, I, I, it really has come to kind of define America and it's kind of interesting. And, you know, it, it's it's celebrated differently everywhere. That's an interesting story, but yep. that, that, that it's been celebrated differently across time. You know, at one point it was celebrated because uh, Georgia troops and, and New England troops had a riot uh, out front of Fort 
Ticonderoga. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, and another time it gets so that, uh, uh, you, you know, that German and American troops in the Battle of the Bulge are sharing soup with each other. It's, it's, it's interesting to see that transformation over time. And it's, 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 this, this episode's a little bit different than most History Guy episodes in that it's, it's a bunch of episodes of different things that have happened rather than one single yeah. storyline. Uh, and uh, and uh, those, you, you know, we could tell that story again with the you know, variety of Christmas, you know, outside of the military. Oh, yeah. These were just interesting stories in the military. But of course, there was also that time where what, what Christmas meant is that we would row across the river and attack your garrison while you were drunk. Uh, and so it's, you know, the, the, this list of things that have occurred uh, at Christmas uh, really did provide kind of an interesting kind of, uh, uh, you know, record of how the celebration of Christmas has changed in America. And, uh, you know, I think really a very fun episode, too. Just nice montage. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, it's interesting, you know, we, we talk about now we can talk about this Christmas of uh, what 1776 when they, when they crossed there at Trenton. And it's a, it's, a, it's an amazing story, but they were not, uh, they were not celebrating the Christmas the way we would, we would think of as Christmas. No, and, I mean, you know, and, and a lot of our Christmas traditions actually came from Germany, things like Christmas trees yeah. and et cetera. So they were, uh, they happened to be a German garrison and uh, they were, you know, they took Christmas fairly seriously and they were surprised, utterly surprised in an attack at the time. Yeah, it's interesting. In the United States, of course, what you talk about later that up into into eighteen twelve, Christmas was not necessarily a popular American tradition because uh, it was we saw it as too British, it's too which British is, or as too uh, too German. Yeah, Catholic like, we saw and it as German, a, kind of all these various. Ceremony, yeah. Yeah, and that was there was a long period of of you know that nativism stuff that was anything that was coming from these other countries we didn't want, and I guess I guess throughout all history, pretty much everywhere, there's always been some nativism <laughs> stuff. But I, I you know that story that that you mentioned about the the soldiers all eating eating at the eating soup at that battle is mm -hmm. uh, is really quite incredible. It it's, is, yeah, and and it's you know, it's a sort of story you hear and say, oh, that's just a story. Uh, until right. you get to the, the fascinating end of that story where on the show Unsolved Mysteries, which has actually come into the history guy a couple of times, but yeah. on the show Unsolved Mysteries, they actually connected the little boy with one of the soldiers that was there and that they met over a bowl of chicken noodle soup. So it is, uh, you know, it's a wonderful story. Uh, and it is, uh, I mean, you know, that and things like the Christmas truce, which happened during yeah. the First World War, uh, really shows that, uh, uh, you know, humanity comes out at particular times. And, and so I, yeah. I, I do think, and I mean, we've done a lot of episodes on various things at Christmas. Uh, there's so many traditions and et cetera involved, but it really does come down to as a celebration, it comes down to a, a celebration of humanity that then tends to shake other historical things that are going on. Yeah. But that, I mean, that is a relatively recent, at other times it meant that you snuck alcohol into the barracks at West Point because, uh, because they told you that you couldn't, you know. Yeah, yeah. The the idea that you were going to tell a bunch of West Point grads, well, really college kids in general, oh, you can't you can't drink anymore the way you were. Uh, but I, these days, I think we we tend not to get. You don't hear so many riots at Christmas time. That's, that, <laughs> yeah, although that's it used to be very much more. Uh, yeah, it, that's it what used you to be did. very much more riot, and there was a lot of uh, stuff that <laughs> happened on Christmas as, as celebrations. And yeah, and, yeah, and, if, and if you, we, go you know, we think back. of the military academy now as being a place of extreme discipline, and and it it seems like. Uh, even up into the Civil War, it was really very much boys will be boys sort of place and, and yeah. a lot of rowdy stuff going on. Yeah, and I, I think that that, you know, that applied to Christmas, too. You know, I mean, part of this episode is that, un unfortunately, no matter what, uh, no matter what holiday we're talking about, but even Christmas time, you know, wars don't just stop so no, that everyone can yeah. go celebrate Christmas. And it's it's interesting that in some ways where people basically said, we will have a pause for for yeah. for you know the Christmas truce. We will we're simply about. choose to, and I mean, I, yeah. I think the one in the Arden there is is really in many ways extraordinary, like the Christmas truce, uh, which yeah. actually we didn't talk about in this episode. That's in another History Guy episode talking about I think Silent Night, where we mentioned the Christmas truce. Uh, but uh, w one of the reasons for doing that episode, and and which I talk about at the end, is is uh, that you know there's this great respect for people who give up their family holidays. Uh, to serve their country. And so, I mean, it yeah. was worth it to talk about what was going on, you know, during that period. I don't, yeah, a lot of people, I don't know, in 1943, the song I'll Be Home for Christmas was written. It's not, it's not an old traditional song. It was made in 1943. And it was in sympathy of, of soldiers who were away at war and couldn't be home for Christmas. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's happened throughout history. 
uh, whether, you know, not just Christmas, but other big events that would have been like that. People were always fighting somewhere. And absolutely, we have troops deployed, but I mean, we also know that there's yeah. people fighting in all sorts of conflicts in the world who aren't able to be home yeah. for Christmas. Uh, and also, you know, there are lots of people who serve in various ways who work on Christmas. You know, someone's manning the, the ER, someone's making sure... You know that the houses that catch fire because they're dry Christmas trees, and that there's someone there to fight the fire. And, yeah. and I, I, it's it, because it is such an important family tradition. Uh, then you have to offer your respect and thanks to people who, who uh, for service beyond themselves, are, are not able to be there for Christmas. Yeah, and I was reminded of that a little bit yesterday. Uh, we had someone come out to fix our our furnace, and uh, if you've been watching the news, it's been extremely cold. So it was it was negative. 20 degrees and another negative 20 on top of that with the wind chill and this guy comes in to fix our furnace and he'd been uh, off an 18 hour shift and had slept like three hours the night before and i i think about that that you know no matter what we're we're doing uh whether it's christmas or thanksgiving or anything like that somebody's got to be out there making sure that we keep the lights on and everyone stays warm and that those kinds of things uh, the the power went out also over oh, over no. that and i'm uh, oh, we, no. we we kept it but some of our some other folks some of our friends in town lost their power and all, you know of course they do when it's negative 35 when the wind chill is the, so. you know the biggest yeah, wow and in my trying to imagine someone in my business, out, out as, as far as the cattle business is concerned, all I can think about is that uh, in Kansas, on our on our on our ranch and all of the feed yards out there, yeah. there are people out there with feed trucks. Yeah. There are cattle that are standing that are standing and uh, and very very cold. One of my my first boss always said, "You have to remember that God gave them a fur coat, and they do really really well." But still, if you think about it, and the and the men. Uh, they're probably they're probably sleeping in sleeping bags. They're going to be staying there all yeah. night. They're going to be watching after, and so uh, 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 taking care of all kinds of things that uh, that need to be taken care of, even if it is or when it, it particularly is when it's as bitterly cold as it is this weekend. Yeah, a lot of. Yeah, I I remember I remember reading about that. I was reading an article about I think uh, dairy producers, and and the fact is that you know your your cows if you're raising them they don't. The cows don't just, you know, stop needing to be taken care of because it's Christmas time. Because it's so a holiday, gotta, yeah. yeah they, and they, they might be more care because it's them. particularly cold this year. So. Yeah, yeah. And so it really is incredible that, you know, we've got such a such a huge and complicated world. And there's there's always people out there who are going to be working uh, at Christmas time when they'd rather be with their families. And they're doing so for important reasons. you gotta, you got to keep those cows cows alive. you got to keep the, the milk and meat and everything else flowing through the... Uh, it's, yeah, it's all, it's you know, all necessary. Still have the needs. And so there's lots of jobs that don't go away because it's Christmas. Yeah. And uh, if yeah. you are able to be home for Christmas, uh, then uh, you know appreciate you the blessing. Blessed. Appreciate the blessing. Yeah. I know. I was reading something the other day saying what the average American says they can spend about four hours with their family before they go crazy. Uh, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of stress around the holidays. There is, but uh, if if you are able to be home uh, and uh, able to spend time with people that, you know, really do love you, then, you know, that's a blessing and, and everybody should appreciate that blessing. And that's part of what this episode was about too. Uh, but I mean, I, I do, I enjoy the mix in the episode because there's some just hysterical stories that are going on and there's some very brave stories that are going on and it ends with a, with a very touching story. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, then you go, you know, at the end that they were able to get together, I think it was a really good yeah. cap on the episode. It's a, it's a, it's a fun episode. I think people enjoy listening to Absolutely. it very much. Yeah. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? So uh, Mom and I really like watching detective shows, so we just checked out the true crime section. There's a lot of wonderful true crime stuff on Magellan, but I mean, you know, long story short in the search, None of it really seemed appropriate for Christmas, and so uh, so we we said so, uh, bloody murder didn't seem like yeah, the kind of thing we ought to be talking about. That might about. be interesting, but it just doesn't feel very Christmassy. Uh, and so and, and so we ended up uh, wandering into the animal documentaries. I guess it's not Christmassy at all, is it? We watched one about about white rhinos, is what we watched, uh, and it's it's part of the, it's called Return of the White Rhino, uh, and it's part of the Stephen Fry series about Last Chance to See. Uh, and yeah. he'd done some other things about it. But, I mean, the story of this one is that uh, white rhinos do not breed well in captivity. Uh, and so that they think by moving these captive white rhinos, I mean, one of them had been captured when he was three and so, uh, spent uh, 35 three. years in the zoo uh, since he was three years old. And they're moving them back to Afri Africa to this reserve 
where they hope that they can breed them and keep the species alive. So, so they took him from Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia, yeah, to uh, to Africa. But you're also wondering, yeah. you know, if I if I stayed in a zoo for 35 years and then they had to poke me and put me to sleep and fly, and it took 30 hours to get there uh, and all of that, I you know, I'm not too sure uh, just how. <laughs> and it was it was snowing. It was freezing cold in Czechoslovakia. It's very hot when they get in the desert. But uh, so and I, you know, we won't spoil the end of it. It's actually it's, it's an extraordinary episode because the entire episodes rather than boxing up these rhinos and getting them to Africa and you end up being very very involved in that you are really you get, very, <laughs> you're, you get to know each of the rhinos and you're excited about how they're going to get there and you're wondering how they're going to do uh, it was an absolutely delightful episode I think Steve Stephen Fry is a delightful narrator for those kinds of shows and uh, and uh, you know white rhinos there were there are only a few of them left so there are four more in Africa now than, than there used to be uh, and I guess we're going to see if they can revive the species uh, and it was a delightful episode I mean we love Magellan TV for a lot of reasons this one turned out to be since we went looking for true crime and and decided that wasn't Christmasy enough. We ended up talking about rhinos in the desert. I don't know. I don't know exactly how we got there, but uh, uh, it was it was absolutely delight. I mean, we well, always enjoy what we the, ded the dedication of these people. It had taken six years for them to put together the plans, figure out how to do it. And all the cages have little man-sized holes that are you know too too small for a rhino, big enough to because if you uh, you got to move fast, they'll. Or they will squish you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The squish was they, the word. <laughs> they will squish you. That's it. Uh, so anyway, we had a great time watching. What 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 have you been watching lately on Magellan TV? So one of the ones I watched recently, uh, also not not terribly Christmassy, uh, although I think they have a Christmas playlist still, and they they usually this is the time of the year they do their best of documentaries for the year too. Um, but I, I watched the Jupiter Enigma, and it was it's a space one. It talks a lot about what the uh, Juno mission discovered about Jupiter and it's a lot about how we're trying to use Jupiter and studying Jupiter to understand kind of how the the early solar system formed and how it existed it talks about some of the things that we've learned about what makes our solar system unique compared to what extra solar systems we've seen so it's really really interesting it talks a lot about kind of how we are examining pieces of Jupiter to understand how other things have formed and how accretion disks and it's all really interesting stuff that if you want you know if you're interested in that kind of science stuff it's a great way to learn about it it's pretty pretty in depth but I always enjoy some science documentaries of course we have watched all kinds of history and animal documentaries there's always something to watch on Magellan TV yeah absolutely uh, their catalog of space documentaries is really extraordinary and I you know yeah. I think that's history I think that that the history of science and tech is, is very much history and, and uh, our discovery there and of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next up, The History Guy talks about candy in the military. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with The History Guy. When you think of military equipment, you might think of anything from tanks to socks, battleships to bandages, but one thing that doesn't typically come to mind is candy. But candy and soldiers have a long history together. Candy has changed the military. Wars have changed candy, and military candy has changed culture. Shoot, candy might even have made a difference in battle. It is history that deserves to be remembered. There's an old adage that an army travels on its stomach. While often attributed to Napoleon, according to the website Quote Investigator, the phrase might instead have originated with Frederick the Great, who died in 1786, but was quoted in an 1858 book by historian Thomas Carlyle with the line, The army, like a serpent, goes on its belly. The point, of course, is that supply is a critical part of military success, or as Napoleon was quoted as saying, there's no subordination with empty stomachs. But the concept of military supply, of course, predates both Napoleon and Frederick the Great. The website of the History Channel quotes Thomas R. Martin, a professor of the classics at the College of the Holy Cross, that ancient sources say that Roman soldiers were given a ration of a pound of meat daily. And thus, Martin says, for an army, you have to kill 120 sheep a day just for the meat ration, or 60 hogs. Martin notes that archaeological evidence shows that Roman armies hunted almost everything that was available. Although he adds that the most important source of calories were carbohydrates, barley or wheat. Noticeably missing, however, from the reported menus of ancient armies is sweets, although sources suggest that the relatively well-fed Ottoman Janissaries had a ration of honey. Despite the energy density and morale effects of sweets, they found little place among military rations. 
For example, in June 1775, when the Massachusetts Provincial Council set the daily allowance of rations for its troops in Boston, the ration included beef, butter, bread, milk, beer, and beans, but no sweets. However, there are records that soldiers were issued or purchased from sutlers chocolate during the Revolution, although a coarse form that would have had to have been boiled as a drink, often mixed with wine. The military website We Are the Mighty notes that undoubtedly it was highly prized because of the high caffeine and sugar content. Sweets were also ignored in rations during the Napoleonic era. Napoleon, who despite his comments about subordination was not always brilliant at feeding his troops, wrote in his orders to the Grand Army that rations should include soup, boiled beef, a roasted joint, and some vegetables, but added, no dessert. It is somewhat ironic, then, that the website Russia Beyond notes on the 100th anniversary of Napoleon's defeat in his 1812 campaign in Russia, Russian merchants commemorated the event by selling Napoleon-shaped chocolates and a new pastry that appeared in the form of Napoleon's hat, which was layered with cream and cut into triangles. The British rations, when fighting against Napoleon, were also devoid of sweets, with the website of the reenactor group 2nd Battalion, 95th Rifles, listing a ration during the time of one and a half pounds bread or flour, or one pound of ship's biscuit, one pound of beef or one half pound of pork, one quarter pint dried peas, one ounce cheese or butter, one ounce rice. While hot chocolate drink was all the rage at home in England, the military rations were a tad more potent, being five pints small beer or one pint wine or one half pint spirits. However, candy was coming into its own in military rations by the time of the U.S. Civil War. For example, while the common confection called the jelly bean might have evolved from a jelly candy called Turkish Delight that dates back at least to pre-biblical times, the jelly bean, the website of manufacturer Jelly Bean Notes, required also a shell coating called panning, invented in the 17th century to make a confection called Jordan Almonds. The two were not combined, however, until 1861, and their first use had to do with the U.S. Civil War. Jelly Belly continues, the earliest known appearance of a jelly bean is an 1861 advertisement for William Shraft of Boston that promoted the sending of jelly beans to soldiers in the Union Army during the Civil War. Being from Boston, the new candy would have far more favored the Union than the Confederacy. Still, soldiers on both sides would have enjoyed sweets. The historic candy maker True Treats notes that Civil War soldiers received food, including sweets and sugars, from numerous places. The government, packages from home, groups and associations, and sutlers, disreputable merchants who followed the troops, selling overpriced, often hard-to-find foods. Still, the Union would have had a candy advantage, as New England had become, at the time of the Civil War, what has been described as the birthplace of the commercial candy industry. This is largely due to the innovation of Boston confectioner Oliver Chase, who in the 1850s had invented both a lozenge cutter and a machine for pulverizing sugar that created a simple candy made of sugar and gelatin and cut into wafers. At the time, the candy was called Hub Wafers, and anecdotes suggest they were popular among Union Army troops. The website War History Online writes, the wafers were an ideal food to give to an army, as they were small, easy to transport, tough, and didn't degrade like other foods. Their sweet taste would have certainly given troops a small mental boost during wartime. After a merger in 1901, the Chase Candy Company changed its name to the New England Candy Company, thus the name by which hub wafers are still produced today, Necco Wafers. Necco Wafers are particularly valuable for militaries because they travel well, remain good in all sorts of weather. They're included in U.S. military rations in the Second World War when part of the Necco factory was given over to wartime production. When Admiral Richard Byrd led the United States Antarctic Service Expedition in 1939 and 40, he took with him enough Necco wafers to provide one pound per week per person for the entire two-year expedition. By the time the U.S. entered the Great War, the U.S. candy industry was well established, and yet the demand by troops for candy affected the industry greatly. Goldenberg Peanut Chews, a concoction of peanuts and molasses covered in chocolate, were created for military rations, providing a high-energy, high-protein ration. The Clark Bar, with a crispy peanut butter and spun taffy core covered in chocolate, was also developed for troops overseas. Both were individually wrapped, uncommon for a time when most candy was still sold from candy stores, for ease of transportation and distribution to troops. Both found success with returning troops who had developed a taste for them overseas. And both are still sold today. The YMCA made an agreement to operate post exchanges during the war. When supplying troops in Europe, they found both importing candy from the United States and buying it from French sources was prohibitively expensive, and so built candy manufacturing facilities in Europe to make candy to sell to U.S. troops. Lara Vogt, a curator at the National World War I Museum, said in the Washington Post this year that the YMCA factories in Europe had a monthly capacity of 20 million tablets or bars to help satiate the sweet tooth of the American doughboys. 
The sugar and caffeine were found to improve both energy and morale, and chocolate was made part of the ration, with soldiers being issued a half pound of candy for ten days. When those soldiers came home, their taste for candy helped to spur a growth of industry that essentially established the candy, and especially candy bar culture, in the United States today. Many of the most popular brands of candy bars, Milky Way, Snickers, O. Henry, Mars Bars, Babe Ruth, and Three Musketeers were invented in the candy boom between the wars. The Washington Post suggests that the Great War and the taste for candy created by it was the reason that the tradition of giving candy treats on Halloween developed in the United States. And it was not just the U.S. The British military recognized candy as a way to boost mood that was less troublesome than alcohol, and chocolate was given to improve troop morale. The importance of candy in military rations, providing calories, energy, and boosting morale was recognized fully in the Second World War. The small candy-coated M&M was included in small cardboard rolls in sea rations and produced under exclusive contract for the military during the war. Once again, the taste soldiers got for the candy resulted in a popular product after the war. The Hershey Company was asked to develop special military chocolate, while the standard K ration included a bar of standard Hershey sweet chocolate. In 1935, Hershey developed a special chocolate bar called the D ration. The idea of the ration was to provide the highest amount of calories in the smallest possible package. The ration was to be usable under any climatic conditions and should be palatable enough for continued use. The D ration was just one four ounce chocolate bar, with the army demand being a weight of four ounces, high in food energy value, able to withstand high temperatures, and taste a little better than a boiled potato. The army didn't want a candy bar that tasted too good because they did not want soldiers eating the emergency rations in non-emergency situations. Hershey also created a special bar for tropical zones that was better tasting but still able to withstand higher temperatures. The venerable Necco wafer, among others, was also produced for the military in large numbers during the war. The U.S. was not the only nation to grasp the value of calorie-dense candies. German rations included a number of different candies, from lemon candies intended to help the soldier withstand cold climates, to mints and chocolate bars, which were produced for the German Air Force and often traded with other service branches. The German recognition of the morale and health effects of candy, however, most showed in their Zustaffer Fleetflug für Fontkampfer, or supplemental rations for frontline soldiers. And Please don't worry about my pronunciation. This special ration was essentially four kinds of candy, a box of cookies, and some cigarettes, and was given to troops preparing for or returning from a major battle. But of all the stories of candy and combat troops, one stands out. In November 1950, some 30,000 United Nations troops, mostly Marines of the U.S. 1st Division, along with some Army troops, British commandos, and South Korean forces, were attacked by an estimated 120,000 Chinese troops around Korea's Chosen Reservoir. The Battle of Chosen Reservoir was desperate, with the Chinese 9th Army ordered to eliminate the U.N. force. Unwilling to surrender, the force was required to break through Chinese encirclement to reach the coast, something to which General Oliver Prince Smith, in command of the 1st Marines, famously said, Retreat, hell! We're not retreating! We're just advancing in a different direction. The Battle of Chosen Reservoir was known not just for being a particularly violent battle, but for the rugged terrain and harsh weather conditions, with nighttime temperatures as low as 35 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, earning the nickname Frozen Chosen. Supplies froze and equipment malfunctioned. The U.N. force did, however, a substantial air support, and the U.S. Air Force Far East Combat Cargo Command in Japan was able to airdrop 250 tons of supplies per day to resupply the trapped United Nations forces. And in the middle of that battle came the Tootsie Roll. The chocolate-flavored taffy-like candy called Tootsie Roll, named after the confection inventor Leo Hirschfeld's daughter, had been manufactured since 1907, and the Marines were about to get a lot of them. Retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel Andy Trainer explains in a video by the Museum of the United States Marine Corps. When they were radioing for information, supplies, or giving status back and forth from their command headquarters, they used code words to indicate different things. In this case, the code word for 60 millimeter mortar ammunition is Tootsie Roll. Battle survivor Bob Weishen explained in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 2001 how the code name went awry. Instead of radioing for additional ammunition, the men used the words Tootsie Roll, hoping the Air Force would understand what they meant. The Air Force didn't get it. They actually airshipped us Tootsie Rolls. You can imagine that the Marines were rather surprised to open boxes of chocolate taffy rather than mortar rounds, but the Tootsie Rolls ended up being a blessing. The Marines' sea rations were frozen. Washington continues, We had nothing to eat but Tootsie Rolls. They were hard because it was so cold, but if you put them in your pocket, your body heat would keep them pliable. If it hadn't been for Tootsie Rolls, many of us would not have made it. 
Fellow Marine Fred Wall said, We were in a terrible shape when it came to food. We had frozen fruit salad. The bread they airlifted was crumbled when it hit the ground. Water in canteens was frozen. But the Tootsie Rolls were a life-sustaining food. You could put it in your mouth and it would get soft. It gave us sustenance, life, and energy. Marine Wayne Queen was quoted in the Charlotte Observer in 2012. It was 35 below. Our food was frozen. We were on our own and low on ammo. Cases of Tootsie Rolls had been dropped by parachute, and the infantry had them in their pockets. They were frozen, but you could put them in your mouth to thaw, and they would give you energy. It was all we had to eat. Those Tootsie Rolls literally saved my life. In addition to providing critical energy, the Marines found that Tootsie Rolls would turn into a sort of putty when warmed, and then quickly freeze again, and so could be used to repair damaged equipment. As the Marines broke through the encirclement and headed for evacuation along the coast, retired USMC Major Dave Vicker says, there were literally hundreds of those Tootsie Roll wrappers lining the roads out of the chosen reservoir. Retired Major Laurel Hill said in the Hanover, Pennsylvania Evening Sun in 2006, ask any man that served at Chosen to be good, a Tootsie Roll must be frozen. The Air Force did eventually figure out the code and start dropping 60 millimeter mortar ammunition. The Marines managed to break through the encirclement and make it to the coast where they could be evacuated. The survivors of the battle refer to themselves as the chosen few, and commemorations of the battle often include Tootsie Rolls, dropped from aircraft. Current U.S. military rations, called Meals Ready to Eat, still contain various candies, including Hershey bars, M&Ms, and Tootsie Rolls, among others. In an odd twist, MREs used to include a type of candy called Charms. You might recognize Charms as the maker of Charms Blow Pops. Charms candy are small square sugar candies that are fruit flavored in different colors. And during the 2001 invasion of Iraq, they developed a reputation among Marines as being cursed. According to the legend, if you eat a yellow Charms, your vehicle would break down. If you ate a green one, it would start to rain. And if you ate a red one, you would die. The only answer, according to the Marines, was to throw your charms away as far away as you could. A blog post on a website called Veterans Breakfast Club suggests that one could trace the path of the U.S. invasion by following the trail of discarded charms littering the desert. Partly because Marines refused to eat them, charms were removed from MREs in 2007. But here's the ironic twist, given that Tootsie Rolls had saved the Marines at Chosen Reservoir in 1950, because Charms Candies are made by Tootsie Roll Industries. I think it's really, really interesting in this episode to talk about candy as a military ration, because mm -hmm. it's not something that they think people think about. Yeah. I mean, I think, but, I think a lot of people, if you ask, they know that M&Ms were made for troops during yes, the Second World War. that's true. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so much trivia. deeper than that. And it's, it's interesting how... Uh, I mean, throughout the wars, but it's also interesting that it wasn't early on. There was no recognition that candy was yeah. was good, and now it's it's an assumed part of military life. Yeah, one of the you know when when I when I wrote that episode for Contro of controversial candies that we mm -hmm. did for for Halloween this year, some of the interesting things I learned there was that most of our modern candy industry uh, owes a lot to the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. and of course, it, sweets existed before that. Uh, especially like they, they talk about the ancient Egyptians uh, using honey. I mean, marshmallow comes from from the ancient Egyptians. But it's an interesting how we didn't talk about it being important for so long, and now it's become vital. It has, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it if you can't imagine significant... sending your troops to war without that being in their in their meal packets, yeah, and and yeah. Uh, and recognize that you know high calorie foods like that are uh, you know when you're burning calories very much are are extremely important, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's you know it's I mean Turkish delight has been around for maybe a thousand years. Jelly beans, which are derived from Turkish delight, were, were made during the Civil War, and, the, and the, the, the whole idea was done around soldiers. It's candy that would be easy for soldiers to carry. And so it is, it's kind yeah. of interesting how the two interact, where that uh, candy bar culture in the United States, where, we, where candy bars really came from candy that was built for the military during the First World War. Uh, and so, I, yeah, there's just a lot of, again, it's another one of these episodes where instead of a single story, it's a bunch of stories. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, all of it, the research on this one was fascinating to me. I had no idea how many candies that we take for granted and that eat were developed for the military or, or have impacted the military. And, you know, all culminates, of course, in the, in the story where the, the, the Tootsie Rolls sent by mistake to the Chosen Reservoir. <laughs> 
uh, ended up uh, saving, you know, why ended up literally keeping thousands of troops from starving, and keeping them alive in, in what was uh, an absolutely extraordinary, uh, one of the most extraordinary yeah. military stories in U.S. military history was the, uh, yeah. the evacuation from Chosen. Yeah. Plus being, yeah. being able to use it to plug up holes and, and fix things. Yeah. Uh, talk about it, uh, uh, something can be utilized a bunch. And, uh, and not history, but something that really amused me, and I thought about while we were watching that, is the fact that uh, here recently I read where uh, one of the uses for the used blades off of, uh, off of the big windmills that we're putting up, <laughs> one of the things they make out of that is gummy bears. And so uh, every time that you, that you eat a little gummy bear, you might think about the fact that uh, it's made uh, out of that it might be made. That's a recycled. It, it, it wind, might be a recycled wind. A recycled off of, wind turbine. Uh, off of a wind turbine, and that it? is the huh. truth. That is actually wow. the, you can. That's you, really you interesting. You can look it up. I don't know. I kind of like to. I just want to. I want. That's an I interesting piece either. of. Uh, I don't know how they, they do it. Where they get the gelatin out of that? I have I, no idea. I don't know, but you can look it up. I we saw haven't it made I... that episode yet. We'll have to do that research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, we, should, I don't, we don't just magically know this stuff. We come up with a topic and we start researching it. And every one of the good things about being the history guys, everything you learn quite a lot. You, there's so much to learn. Uh, That's and, really interesting. And this interesting. episode was another one that was a fun one. It ties to so many things. So, you know, you know candies that have been around forever, like nickel wafers. Uh, and uh, those had a lot to do. Jelly beans had a lot to do with it. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, there's just a lot of great who knew that they that they had a special chocolate bar made uh, during the Second World War that was supposed to not be tasty. Uh, that was that was to be. Yeah. So they didn't taste good so that they wouldn't keep stealing the chocolate bars out of the. Yeah, that was uh, that was actually that's just hysterical that they specifically designed a chocolate bar that like only kind of tasted. Yeah, good. A, they wanted it better to taste... than a boiled potato. They wanted if you had a choice between that and the boiled potato, you'd eat the boiled potato because they only wanted you to eat that after you're out of boiled potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, it's, it's a really it, interesting. I would, you know, I'd like to find one and and eat it on episode and see what they see if they agree. I don't know if those are still. But to one of the things I think was important and and is something I immediately thought of is the fact that that it is such a good morale booster. That's mm -hmm. something yeah. sweet. It it helps the body, uh, you know, uh, that way. But it also then it makes you feel good, and it still does that today. Uh, even you know. No, even though we're not we're not marching in the army, yeah. And so, but the fact that it actually has a spiritual lift to it, uh, mm -hmm. I think, is just fascinating and something that, that was necessary. My goodness, yeah. if you think and about we, we those saw soldiers. in the comments on that that soldiers today, I mean, they, you know, comes in the packets, and that uh, uh, everybody remembers what their favorites were and what they traded for. And uh, so, I mean, I think it is still an important thing that you know per, that helps to deal with with boredom and also but with energy and all sorts of things and you know for the yeah. for the german army in the second world war i mean when you got that box that had was full of different candies and cookies you knew that the they were sending you into combat you know that was that was their yeah. you know that was that was the ration they gave you before they sent you in where so i mean that's it's extraordinary that uh, that you know that that was recognized and it's, it's kind of strange then that that in antiquity uh when you had armies marching on their stomach didn't and, and a part of this episode yeah. is really just talk about how military rations have changed over time, I mean, the part was really interesting is just hear what were rations during the, the, the Napoleonic Wars or what were rations during, yeah. for the Greek or the Roman army. Uh, and, uh, and it's kind of interesting that now those are a central piece of it to the point where I think, you know, people will throw away every other part of the meal and still keep the candies. Uh, except for yeah. those ones candies that everybody was throwing out there during the Gulf War, which is an interesting which story I too. Absolutely love, and I would like to. I, can we do more research to figure out how we originally came up with? Yeah, who, who decided? Red, that, red got you killed, and charms, yellow, yellow charms got... were bad luck. Yeah, <laughs> it's it was an interesting, interesting it's one. It's a bona fide uh, effect because we found it on several pages, but there were other people that responded in this episode saying, "I ate those things, and I never heard that." Uh, and <laughs> uh, and some suggesting maybe it occurred before the Gulf War that that, that, that people had that myth before the Gulf War. But I mean, it's it's you know that would be a story about super superstitions in the military and how those superstitions yeah. arise and it's kind of interesting that you know those tied to candy but i mean if you look to you know and it's easy to look up if you look up you know the history say of u.s military uh, rations uh what you're going to see is through, throughout throughout the history of those you're going to see candy in those rations well and, and i love a lot of people kind of gauge when they were in the military what period by what candy was in the rations at the time <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's that's how important it is. Yeah, I love the part where they said that uh, uh, you could see all the Tootsie Roll wrappers. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah coming out of. Yeah. I thought that was really, really, really fascinating. That uh, uh, you could tell where they'd been or what they were doing, and so I thought that was great. Yeah, oh, well, that's such a good story too. That the Air Force yeah. heard them order Tootsie Rolls and thought they meant Tootsie Rolls, and so they dropped them and ended up saving <laughs> everybody's life. And still today, when you have reunions for the and, and you know it's getting fewer and fewer because that was in 1950. But uh, when they yeah. have reunions, they would they would traditionally they would have a plane fly over and throw Tootsie Rolls out. 
Yeah, that's an incredible that's an incredible story, and the, and this whole idea that this was candy that you know actually saved lives. Yeah, and uh, kept equipment working. That's yeah. that's that's so yeah, funny they, to imagine that they, they were. I mean, I, I read in enough reports that I guess that it's true that they would have a jeep that had been hit by you know gunfire and put holes in you know radiators, uh, and that this stuff. You could soften it up, squish it over the hole, and it would harden enough that you could patch huh. a hole in a radiator, a gas tank, or a hose with Tootsie Roll. And yeah, that's I mean that's an amazing it's an amazing story to think about that you know and Tootsie Rolls are uh, they've always actually been one of my favorite candies. I guess something I learned on the when doing research for that controversial candy episode, uh, they're not necessarily the most popular of candies. I oh, really? they showed up. They showed up fairly often on lists of people, ones that people didn't like. Oh, yeah, that them and, me. Them in Dots, too, which are also made by Tootsie, and again, uh, yeah, one of my favorites. Both Dots yeah, fans, so I was, yeah. yeah, I was surprised that's by the, that. Because that, that's the Tootsie Rolls are the candy that I steal out of the kids' Halloween stash. Yeah, well, the first time I, I learned about it, there's like this this bag you can buy that's like a child's child's play is what it's called, and it's full of all kinds of Tootsie Rolls and Tootsie Pops and stuff like that. And I, I went to pick that up, and uh, my wife was like, "Oh, that's the that's like the crappy candy," and I was like, "What? That's the candy is this you something don't want to give?" Agree, huh? That's and the candy apparently, you don't want to give it Halloween, huh? Apparently, it's at least widely enough known that I, I was surprised by the number of people who were like, <laughs> "Yeah, that stuff's just gross." Uh, so yeah, I guess I guess we're odd liking the. Tootsie Rolls and Dots, but hey, t now I can argue Tootsie Rolls, hey, they saved they saved lives and fixed Jeeps in, <laughs> in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> you should you should respect them. Um, I think we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, I, I think and I think Grandma Betty really hit on it, you know, why soldiers treasured candy so much. And I think part of it is that, you know, it, it's, it reminds them of home and it's, yeah. it's, it is a luxury to some extent. And of course we kind of showed in this, that it's also uh, very useful, yeah. but that, that the, the morale booster really is, is, is important. I think, um, I think it's interesting that both M&Ms and jelly beans kind of for the same reason that they've got a coating on them, that that's why people could carry them mm -hmm. around. And I, I got to imagine that if you're, you know, if you're in battle, uh, it's freezing your butt off someplace, uh, as as soldiers often were. That it probably felt pretty nice to be able to eat a jelly bean. And it, well, it's surprising how many candies we have were actually invented for the military, and then they came home and they yeah. had the taste for it, and so it goes out in the public thing. But I mean, it's That's also crazy. I mean, it's it's a different life than we're probably used to sitting in our our warm homes. Uh, that you know, the problem with candy is it's very calorie dense. You know, it makes you fat. But uh, if you're out in the cold, you're, you're burning 10,000 calories or 50,000 calories a day running in the, in, in, et cetera, uh, then it can, uh, your blood sugar can very much be an issue. Uh, then actually that's a very efficient way yeah. to keep your soldiers in the field. And it's, it's interesting that it took time kind of for the science to understand that. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, they weren't, candy wasn't in rations in the Civil War, but I mean, that was one of the things that families could send. Uh, and yeah. that would uh, you know remind them of home and that they loved, and then that led to the development of candies that would last well uh, in the field, and then that you know ends up being now to the idea where I, I don't think modern soldiers would even think about going to war without uh, without sweets. Yeah. Well, and, that, and you know, you talked about them being individually wrapped in those uh, World War One, uh, which was which was a new thing, and it, it mm -hmm. took. Uh, I think again we mentioned that in that candies episode is that the we didn't really get things like you know polyurethane plastic and stuff like that the stuff we wrap candies in frequently now uh, that was that was like a 1940s 50s thing uh, when we started to be able to individually wrap everything and so before that yeah you'd, you'd walk into a candy store and have a bucket full of taffies or whatever but they probably weren't individually wrapped. Yeah, uh, which I think is an interesting piece, and that, that that was something again that the military started. The, to the do. military started, and and then that might be led to the tradition of giving candy on Halloween, which I mean is a yeah. very, it's a different tradition in the United States than it's done in other places, uh, because those individually wrapped candies made that possible. And yeah, it's yeah. A, it's kind of interesting how they all wrap together in history. It's it's always just so interesting how I, and I think that's one of the cool things about you know these kinds of episodes where you get to talk about lots of different little things across history because we. We can talk about the various different kinds of episodes there are and the, the ways that you write about <laughs> this or that. But these ones, these ones are interesting because you get to talk about uh, so much time and over a long, long period of space and time and find out kind of how this has affected human history. Yeah. And it's interesting how it's affected different places. And uh, especially, you know, I think we focused on in these, these two episodes how uh, it worked in, in the American military. But it's, it's really, really cool to learn that, you know, that 
we have had this candy for so many years that essentially the advent of candy as a, uh, as a, as a real big industry owes quite a bit to the fact that soldiers were, were eating it out while yeah, they were it's, in it's combat. it's fascinating how they tie together. You know, the thinking behind both of these episodes is that I started off with something, uh, the, the chosen reservoir for this one and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the part in the Ardenza for the other one, and it just wasn't quite long enough to make an episode out of. Uh, and there were other things too that were interesting, and so that starts piecing together as an episode. And those are, you know, yeah. they're different. They're, I mean, the storylines are different, but they also end up telling their own story. And, and so I, I really, these are, I enjoy both of these episodes, uh, and I think that people are really going to enjoy uh, hearing them here on the podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.